have Georgi Buzaki, professor of neuroscience at NYU, who's a, uh, a lover of neural syntax, as we all are, member of the NAS, National Academy of Sciences, and today it's a, no, it changed. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery of the Brain Explained. Dear Nikos, the mystery. The mystery is not in the brain. We made it up. Okay? When we don't understand something, we make up a couple of words and we pretend that those words that we made up explain what we don't understand. Now, humans are very good in making up things. And here's a proof that, indeed, this is a list that has been made up or inherited. And most of you know that this is uh, from the Bible of, uh, of psychology from uh, William James. And everybody in this room can identify herself or himself with one of these items because we just take this word and said, oh, this is particularly interesting, perception of space, or let's say consciousness of self. I'm going to devote my entire life trying to figure out the brain mechanisms of that. Now, there is a fundamental problem with this one, namely that, of course, William James didn't make up this list. He inherited them, mostly from the British empiricists. Now, in turn, the empiricists inherited them from Christian philosophers. And the Christian philosophers, you can go back all the way to uh, maybe uh, 2,000 years to... Uh, uh, Nicholas's ancestors, like Aristotle, and in Athens, you could have talked about exactly the same things. In other words, we are using a dreamed up vocabulary that we inherited, and we are trying to pretend that those words here, those phrases, have boundaries from each other, and the task for neuroscience is to figure out brain mechanisms with those boundaries. Now, there are, that's already a ridiculous thing. But the problem is that if you look at this thing, this is all biased. It's biased by Christian philosophies because this is all about the inputs. And according to this biased framework, the goal of the brain is to understand the truth, to choose between good and bad. And whatever we do, and these are the phrases that we use, the brain is about associations or Pavlovian conditioning and so on and so on. And the brain is a passive device. Now, the problem with this framework is that if there is a brain that is perceiving the world and is trying to process it, this is what we use, information processing is done by the brain, then it has to do something with it and in order to generate an output. Now, there is a problem with this outside in, namely the problem is always sits somewhere in the middle. The middle is this. Either we call it a black box, we can call it an intervening variable, representation, consciousness, and all those things that we don't really understand, but we use them as a potential target uh, to, for, for discussion. So I suggest that perhaps there is a better way, or an alternative way to think about this, namely to try to think about all these things as the brain is not about understanding the truth. The brain is there only to generate output and to register the consequences of the outputs in the service of the body. And of course, if you buy into this, then you said, oh, there is a little uh, a problem with that, because, uh, because these two types of uh, frameworks have totally different predictions, and then uh, which one is right, which one is wrong, is a matter of negotiation. So the outside-in framework typically predicts that we go from specifics to general, that we have all these features out in the, brain, in the world, and we have to bind those features together to get a whole and to get a picture. If you think the other way around, they said, no, no, the brain comes with an uh, attitude, it comes with, with, the, with, the, with the compromise that good enough behavior is good enough. And we can generalize a lot, and, and we can leave the problem much later on to figure out the specifics and uh, the details. Now, if you are in the first category, the, the old framework, I would say, then this is the kind of experiments you are doing. And the, the kind of experiments are there that they, you design an uh, 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 experiment, you present signals, and then you are recording something inside the brain. Now, there is a little problem with that, 
is that the, the information that comes between the two, the associations that you can make up between the outside world and what happens in the brain, is information only for the experimenter. Those neurons that you are recording from do not see the world. They have no clue what they are seeing. All they see is the upstream neurons are providing action potentials. In other words, there is no grounding, what philosophers call grounding problem. There is no way to tie something to anything else. If you would like to learn to speak Chinese, then you have to ground every single utterance or every single word with something that already exists in your mind. So what is available, what else is available for the brain other than trying to understand the proof, the truth outside there? And the answer is action. Action is available. And Bob, both Bob and, and Mickey very beautifully already explained that they didn't dare to generalize, so I will, that every single output, be it a motor movement, pupillary change, uh, even hormonal output, or be it a thought, has a corollary discharge, that it informs the rest of the brain that I am the action, I am the, the agent of what happens to, the, the, to my sensors. So if you look at the, this, this picture this way, then Carandini, Churchland, wouldn't have been able to publish their paper, certainly not in science, because it would be trivial. There would be no surprise that a majority of the neuronal variability that, uh, that uh, David talked about to us in V1, the primary sensory cortex, is in fact modulated by the output of the brain because this is what the brain cares about. And only a very small fraction is in fact coding what we call sensory information. So with this, with this framework, you can say, let's go back to try to solve many of these mysterical words. And of course, you can pick many of them, but I, I, took, I picked two because those are probably the most difficult, that all of you would say they are not negotiable. Time and space is something that we are all aware of. There is no way we can do experiments without time and space. Without time and space, nothing exists in the world. Especially in neuroscience, because when we come to my favorite structure, the hippocampus, then this is the definition we have to deal with. The most precious things we have is our own private episodic memories. So if you would like to understand us, or we would like to understand ourselves, we have to understand how our episodic memories are made. Now, this is a wonderful approach, because what it does is say, oh, we have to understand what happened to me. The me is a very complicated question, we can discuss it later. But where and when? So the idea is that we code with three separate zones, some input, and, and we put them in three separate registers, and just like in, in, in the Newtonian world, that the things are put into the, this container, the big theater, and then we stamp a time point on it, and we are done. And then we would like to reconstruct our memories. All we have to do is multiply and bring them together, the what, the, 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 the where, and the when, and then we can do the mental travel. Now, this is all good, but you know, something happened outside neuroscience, especially in physics, namely 1905, 1915, then physicists like Albert Einstein told us that, oh, that's not so simple. The, 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 the world is not a container. The time is not an arrow. Time can go backward and forward. Uh, so we have a little time. But this issue has never been addressed by neuroscience. People who were doing uh, work or were interested in timing, they worked in the striatum, the cerebellum, and people who were interested in space and think they were in the parietal cortex and the hippocampus, so there was a peaceful hundred years. Now, in the past five years or so, maybe ten years or so, the problem of time and space clashed mostly in the hippocampal system. So, let's go to the basics. Everybody knows about the elements. Of, uh, of navigation that, that, that is needed, about figuring out something about space. We need head direction system, we need a, a grid system to, to, to lay out the environment, and then you have to locate yourself with the help of, 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 of place cells. Now, this is interesting, but all of these are static things. And, you know, and a map, what you have is just a map. The map doesn't help you to guide. If I have a map in the hippocampus, it doesn't explain how I'm actually moving my, my, my feet. So, because navigation is about action. You have to do 
you have to move, you have to calibrate everything that is related to sensation. There would be no way to know whether the, the persons in the back row are tiny little, little heads, or they have the same head because there would be a size, size, size constancy that I learned through my ontogenetic experience. The, the, the real problem, of course, is that if time and space are equivalent, as Albert Einstein said, then why are we looking for them separately in the brain? If they are equal, for example, in, there are many, many in the, the uh, languages, Half of the world languages don't use tense. Uh, uh, the ch time and space are interchangeable in many, many cases. So let's see what happens in, the, in the, the brain, for example, in the hippocampus. I assume that many of you know what a play cell is. The animal is running through this uh, maze here, and this neuron, which is a play cell, fires a couple of action potentials. But it can do it with a fast run and a slow run. When the animal is running slow, then there are 10 theta cycles that are active during the play cell while the animal traverses the play cell. When the animal is running twice the speed, then there are only five theta cycles. But if you look at the number of the action potentials, they remain pretty much the same, independent how, far, uh, how uh, fast the animal is running. Now, that's an interesting thing, because those neurons that are play cells in the hippocampus, they oscillate faster than the ongoing theta activity, which is the individual, the cell that is being activated, runs away from the group, from the majority, and oscillates faster than everybody together. Now, if you have two of these things, then, then you have interference picture. When you have interference, you have precision timing. And you can measure this oscillation frequency by doing a simple autocorrelogram. That is, what are the intervals of repetition? And you can see whether the autocorrelograms are warped as a function of running speed? And the answer is yes. The animal runs faster, the oscillation frequency is faster. So now we can count just the number of repetitions at the state of frequency of this one single neuron. We have time, and we have running speed. At least we can measure one thing, which is the running speed. And when you have the two, then you can calculate the third. And this is what bugged me in high school when I was in, in high school and I learned about the relationship between speed, time, and, 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 uh, and uh, the distance, that it's redundant. If you have two, the third one is given to you for free. So is it about space or is it about time? And it seems that this oscillation that is generated inside here. And it has no, the, 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 only the, the speed can modulate it and the phase of the theta oscillation has no information about what happens outside in the real world. What I'm trying to say is, instead of viewing it as if the hippocampus would be an honorary V1 that is being driven by the outside cues, it is an internally generated pattern calculating what's going to happen to me, what happens to the agent when it runs through the place field. So if this is the, 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 the idea, then you would like to know what actually is being represented. So one idea or one possibility is that everything is driven by the outside world. The, the sources or the, the signals or the stimuli, it's a funny thing, we call them stimuli, as if every physical object would be stimulating me, uh, are generating the sequences. The other way to think about it is, no, 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 there is a self-organized sequential activity. Self-generated activity that is perpetually active, as, as, as David already dis discussed with us a little bit. So from this point of view, you can say, aha, uh -huh, there are at least two different ways to think about all of these things. And, and the reason why I can give this talk to you is because I have a cell assembly system in my brain that started somehow with, with, with the chairman's introduction, and then it calls up another assembly, another assembly, another assembly, and my assemblies will be continuing as a long, long trajectory throughout my talk without any input from you guys. So, uh, if that is the case, let's examine what is the implication of this idea in the hippocampus. So, initially, nature worked out a mechanism in the brain that the animal can deal with distances and cues outside there, and it, 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 it allowed to, to make a mechanism that we call spatial navigation. 
I don't have time to go about the, the, the different aspects of it. There is a dead recording type of navigation, which is all about me. I can walk around this, this room, come back to the same position, uh, because I've got idiotic information in my body. But also, I have corollary discharges that help me out to calculate the vectors to come back from, from, to my starting point. And once you, I have that, then you can, you can explore the world. Once you explore the world, you can generate a map, and then you get explicit knowledge. The previous one is about me. The other one is independent of me. This is why we call it egocentric versus allocentric. Now, what happened over the evolution, I assume, is that the brain, at one point, can disengage from the world. And once you disengage from the world, the machinery doesn't disappear. The machinery is inside the brain still working on. So now we can do what uh, psychologists used to call, it, especially uh, Enver Tulving, mental travel. So we can go back to the past, and we can go back to, we can go to the future. One we call memory, or you can call it postdiction, or you can have your imagination, and you can think about prediction. And indeed, the point that I'd like to make is that that we use the same algorithm, we use the same exact structure or the interactions between structures in the brain to call it by two different names. One is we call it navigation, the other one we can call it mental navigation, or again, I use a, a couple of other words, but it doesn't matter how you call it, the hippocampus just computes exactly the same thing. So, if this is the case, we would like to show at least some data that indeed it's possible to generate these self-organized activities without any help from the outside. All we have to do is train an animal in a hippocampal dependent task, go left, go left, and the animal has to behave exactly the same. It has to run in the same direction, with the same speed, between the trials for a predetermined amount of time. So in, in this case, there is no space that would change, no sensory information would change, it's all constant, and the idiotetic information called path integrating sources from the body are also the same. So the th prediction from the theory, from, uh, from, from cognitive map theory, would be that there would be a subset of cells that are dealing about the XY coordinates of the Cartesian system, and then, because you are here, a subset of cells should fire as long as you are running in the wheel. Okay? And, of course, this is not what we found. What we found is that every line here is a neuron, and the red colors show the activity of neurons, and then we assigned, these are the same neurons, this is the neuron 1, neuron 2, neuron 3, neuron 1, neuron 2, neuron 3, and the first trajectory we arbitrarily made up, showing that there is a nice trajectory, the, every, the, uh, the whole part of the journey is covered by several neurons, and the, the difference that you can see between the two of them is that we separated when the animal made a left in the future or we made a right turn into the future. So you, you can call it decision or, or you can come up with any other words. The point here is that you can take any time point here, at the very beginning of the, the journey, the middle of the journey, the end of the journey, and you can compare this population vector with this population vector and you can make an intelligent guess whether the animal will go to the right or to the left with 90% accuracy, including errors. So we can read out the decision or the will of the animals 15, 20 seconds ahead of what we actually see. So this is, this is cool, we have done this before, but you may have noticed that instead of distance, on the, the, on the X coordinate now, I showed you time, but we can measure the distance the animal ran, we can measure the number of steps and a lot of things, but I showed here uh, the, the, the time here. And there are three animals on the upper right corner, and you can see from the upper right corner, is that we can calculate the duration of the run with high accuracy. So that's an interesting thing, because when my good friend, uh, Howard Eichenbaum, seen this, he said, aha, uh -huh, we've been looking for the where for a long time, but in 1971, John O'Keefe found the where. We, we already have the what, because I showed you that the what can be determined very nicely from the differences of the trajectories. And we were missing the, where, the, the when. And so Howard says, well, you can calculate the where with your 
spatial navigation system, but we can call these neurons also time cells because from the population vector or even from the firing rate of a few neurons, you can tell how far the animal traveled in its journey during wheel running. Okay? So now we, we close the system, we get where, what, and when, and the hippocampus is a perfect place. It can bind together these three different information. There is a little problem here. The problem here is that the only thing that we measure is the neuronal change, the sequence of the activity or the trajectory. And out of this only one thing, I can say the animal will go to the right or left, which is the what. I can say how far the animal went if I compare my measurement with a rod. Or if I look at the clock, then comparing with the clock, I can say this is time. So we, there is one measurement and three names. Okay? But the problem, of course, is that brains don't measure distance or duration. They cannot make up on They don't even de detect. We are the ones who are detecting it. Okay? We don't have any of these. The most important thing, the last point that I want to make here, is that the experimenter has a dual rule. We make the instruments that we are using to make the measurements with, and these are the units that we call space and time. Remember that before measuring units for space and time existed, space and time was a mystery. Later on, we had units, therefore it was science. But you know, Einstein said the, the, the time is what is measured by a clock. Intelligence is what is measured by the IQ test, and so on, and we can, can keep going and say this is a circularity because, because it's circularity. But of course some people panic, said what if you, you, if you take away the time and space for me, then, then what, what happens? And the answer is, oops, a little bit covered there, so how are we going to define episodic memory? So maybe before I define episodic memory, this is easy to say, that, or important to say, that it doesn't really matter what, how we call it. The important thing is what, and, and what the experimenter calls it, whether the experimenter has a beautiful code to decode those things that he or she is capable of, of correlating. The important thing is whether downstream neurons can make any useful thing what comes out from the hippocampus. And if you look at it this way, then of course it's not a surprise that that the hippocampus computes all the time exactly the same thing, independent, and is blind to modalities and blind to another, many other things. It just gets inputs, computes something, and sends the input back to the neocortex. But if your expectation is one thing, or you set up the experiment one way, you can say this is time, space, sound frequency, or whatever you want. So maybe. Episodic memory is not about that. Episodic memory is nothing else but, but what the hippocampus does best. And the hippocampus' best thing that it can do is generate sequences. And it generates sequences all the time. And whether it's mental space or real time, it doesn't matter. And, and then it communicates the sequences to the neocortex. So why is it good? The reason why it is good is because it's also savings. Remember that having three things decoded in three separate channels, such as space, time, and, and, and the what, is useful because it saves a lot of computational space or, or storage space. Now, this is also good because now the hippocampus codes a content poor, a perhaps a content free sequences. The only thing it knows that what things in the neocortex should be connected and what the sequence should be to point here, to point there, and so on. So, I use the metaphor of that the hippocampus is a librarian that doesn't know the content of those books that are represented by the neocortex, but it knows where to point and what sequence, for example, if you would like to understand vision, go to the first book, second book, third book, and uh, the, the recent reviews by, uh, by our outstanding colleagues. So this is all very nice as a speculation. But it shows that, indeed, the brain cares mostly about the outputs. The hippocampus is a, a generator, and you can say, how is it possible to generate sequences, or how is it possible to generate some sort of activity without being a tabula rasa and getting the input 
from the outside world imposed on the brain? And the answer is that the brains, the first thing that the brain does is generate a spontaneous activity. This is, this is very useful because if you assume that we have a system that doesn't require any input in order to maintain its own activity, we don't have to worry about catastrophic interference. We don't have to worry about many, many other things. The brain dynamic is the primary thing that the brain circuits are about, and it's maintained, and it matures, even if the, my brain would be isolated from my, my day one after my birth, and somebody would measure the EEG activity, or would do statistics about spine size and so on, the statistics would be very much the same. In other words, experience does not, or the other way around, brain complexity or the number of patterns that you have in your brain is, doesn't scale with experience. If it doesn't, then we have a problem that I try to solve. So, we are very envious of physics, because physics have laws. And we sometimes try to make up our own laws, but other investigators don't like our laws, so they don't use it. But there is one that is a fundamental rule that everybody accepts that it's a law, is the Weber factor law, which is a log rule. And what I'd like to tell in my second part of my, my story is that, that this psychophysics law, which, which applies also to distance, time, episodic memory length, everything almost that we, we know as, as, a, as a cognitive performance, is that it's supported by a structure that follows these log rules, and this structure is capable of giving rise to a log dynamic. So let me start with the end, and the simplest thing is that let's take a neuron type, which is layer five pyramidal cell projecting to the thalamus. This is a type by all criteria. And then you take thousands of them and ask a simple question, what is the typical firing rate of layer five neurons? And the answer is, is no such a thing as typical, because the firing rate distribution is log normally distributed. That a majority of the spikes at every single time is generated by a minority of the neurons. And I'm giving you the second clue, is that those diligent minorities are diligent all the time for the rest of your life. It's not that sometimes somebody is working hard and then the, the next moment another neuron is taking uh, its, its place. So, if you look at the firing rate distribution anywhere in the brain, including the anterior horn of the spinal cord of the lamprey, or the turtle, they have log normal firing rate distributions. And there are many other things that are log normal. Almost everything I know in the, <laughs> in, in the brain has these distributions. And the exciting thing is that these levels are not funny statistical chances, but they intermingle with each other or interconnected with each other. A firing rate of a, of a neuron tells you a lot. If a firing rate is high, the neuron bursts more. If a firing rate is high, its, it's axonal length is longer. The connectivity among the faster firing rate neurons is stronger. They have access to uh, the, the low firing neurons more than the low firing neurons themselves, and so on. They have a higher axonal caliber, and so on. So th indeed, this is the, 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 the issue. And you said, why on earth you would like to have such a diversity? And the answer is because it is diversity that drives biology. You have two types of diversity. One is component diversity, that is interneurons, many times of interneurons, pyramidal cells, and so on. But within even the same type, you try to make things as different as possible, as different we are as humans. And the, the good thing about this is that, that it probably, it's a wide guess, this is the fundamental reason why the brain can deal with all those difficult things, such as shown here, that is, they are competing with each other, but each of them will be given equal weight because of the wide distributions. So I mentioned already that this, some neurons like to fire more, they are better connected, that gives you an enormous constraint how, what, how computation can proceed in the brain. But it is, 
gives you something else, namely that I already told you that the, most of the, the, the brains already regard the world as old. A new form brain doesn't think the world is new. There is nothing new for the brain, nothing new, nothing new for your brain. There is no way you would come into this room, I've never been in this room, but I said, my God, you know, this is, what is it? The initial response was, it's a room, and it's an auditorium. So I already have a lot of information about all this kind of things, that even if you show me a, a, a Martian, I wouldn't be surprised because the, the brain always comes up with a good guess. And then when the good guess is, has some discrepancy with the previous expectations, then, then we go after and learn more about this. So the interesting thing is that once you record a neuron for half an hour in the home cage tonight, I can put the animal in any environment and then have a good prediction which neurons will fire and probably at what rate relatively to each other based on my home cage recording, even if they put the animal in a completely new environment. So this is what is shown here. This is a firing rate measured measure during sleep before in the home cage, and then the next day the animal was in a completely new environment. And whether it's a new or old, it doesn't matter. The, you can see from the log scale that the correlation is extremely high. So, this is all about rates, but you already see that there is some relationship between one situation and other situation. The question is, how does it translate to something that we measure in relation to the world? So one of the things that we asked for a long time, and we were killing each other in the hippocampal field, whether every pyramidal cell has only one single place field, or it can have many. And the answer is that, yes, it can have many, but it, there is a distribution. Um, the, most of the pyramidal cells have only one. Some of them can have five or even more. So, same situation if you have a radial arm is that said, what is the probability that this neuron will identify this and only this arm? The probability is very high, 85% of the neurons can do that. But a small percentage of neurons will fire in every single arm. Now, a similar experiment was done by, uh, by Albert Lee. This, it, it's a 65 a 64 meter long track, and most of the neurons only fire at one particular position. They are the typical so called place cells. And, but there is this neuron here. So, this is the typical neuron that has one place field. But this is the atypical one. This is end of the distribution somewhere here that has 50 or so uh, place fields. And this is not an outlier. No, when, when I remember when, when Per Andersen, if you know anybody knows the name, uh, he used to show a EPSP from, I forgot which structure, he said, this is 200 times bigger than anybody has ever seen. And everybody told him that, show me another one. <laughs> and then eventually people found one, but it's very difficult because from out of a thousand measurements, you, you, are, you have to be lucky to have one of these. So, Mosers have done a similar thing. They said, what is the, what is the rule for remapping or which is orthogonalization, how good the hippocampus is, this, this was and still the dominant idea that in every single situation the hippocampus remaps and there's a new map in every single world, every single part of the world. If you come into this room, there is one map and so on. But, but what is so embarrassing about that is that, that if everything is new and you need a new map for it, then where is my accumulated knowledge that I acquired throughout my 70 years or so, uh, that I'd like to have a generalized information. I'd like to see what is familiar in the novel. So they have to f preserve something that is really uh, 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 knowledge-based. So the, the interesting thing here is that in every single room, 80% or 85% of the, the neurons fired only one room. But 2.2% of the neurons find in every room, 4.5% of the neurons find in half of the room, and so on, so there's a distribution. So that's already connecting us, us to a log, log. One is firing rate, the other one is the representation. But there is more here, is that the rate can already tell you, tell you whether the place field will be large or small, or whether you will have one place field or several place fields. Now, of course, if this is the case, then you have to face the following problem. The majority of the neurons say you are in a different room, or this is novel, 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 novel. But the minority are telling you the opposite. 
that no, this is just like everything else before. So they, of course, communicate this down to downstream readers. And the downstream readers, we don't exactly know what they do. They count every output as, as one vote, or some individuals have stronger votes. So this is a strong end input. This is, says, oh, this is familiar, familiar. This one says novel, novel. And of course, this is a problem that we have to solve. But the nice thing is that there is a distribution, and we call the two ends of the distribution with different words. We call it novel and familiar. But in fact, there is everything in between. Now, if these are, these, these are, you are still with me and you didn't throw tomatoes to me, then we would like to know that how they arise. I don't know, we are working on it, but, but at least I can say a few words about the second one, is that how are they maintained and uh, what useful function they may play. So the first clue about maintenance, yeah, I give you the answer, it is sleep, as, uh, as uh, both Yangdan and, and uh, Julio already told you about, that sleep is very important for a lot of things, is, and including for this one. So, Non-REM sleep has these nice up and down states. We know they are important for a variety of different things, but it's important for us is because that's a perfect segregator of slow and fast neurons. Why am I saying that? These are different neurons measured during the fire rate is measured in the first half and the second half, and you see that the two lines are similar. And this is the recruitment sequence of those neurons during up and down states. The, the takeaway message is that those neurons that fire fast, fire first, and the ones that are lousy, they just come at the tail. And they keep doing this sequence over and over and over again. Now, there is a very interesting consequence of this. The first one is that those neurons that fire fast, they overlap more, they synchronize more, trivial. Those neurons that are fast rarely, they don't fire together, trivial. The interesting thing is that those neurons that fire fast or slow, they never fire together. The reason why they never fire together, because this up and down state distribution segregates them. This neuron and this neuron hardly fire together. They are there with some delay. And if they are there with some delay, if there is such a thing as spike time independent plasticity, the consequence of this is that the fast firing neurons during sleep, as the Julie already told us, they are decreasing their firing rate but the slow-firing ones are actually increasing, and then the log-normal distribution from the left hand and the right hand will be a little bit squished to the middle. So this is a kind of a slightly different homeostasis than Julia was talking about, but probably the fundamental principles are the same. Now, the neocortex has this up-and-down state. The hippocampus has its funny up-and-down state. The up-state, we call it sharp-wave ripples. And the sharp wave ripples are, are there, and they do the same kind of sequence. And I said, oh, if these are useful, then are they playing some interesting role? And the answer is yes, they do. So when you train animals in a novel environment, and you measure their correlations before and after the learning during two separate sleeps, and then you, you, all you do is generate a correlation matrix, and you will find that the fast neurons fire together, the slow firing neurons fire less, and then they slow and the, the fast are even less. Uh, during post learning, this is the picture, this is the important one, is that as a result of learning, the fast firing neurons are not modified. But the majority of the slow firing neurons are there as for a reserve. Those are the ones from where you can pull off neurons whose modification will be useful for learning. And this is shown here. Now, this is the scary part. Uh, neurons fire fast or, 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 or slow, and you can measure the sequences I, I mentioned, uh, the, the probability of discharge during events such as the sharp wave ripple, and what this figure shows is that those neurons, they fired fast or slow during a natural ripple, a self-organized pattern, are the same neurons that respond to an optogenetic perturbation from outside. So we generate a pattern, we generate an artificial ripple, and in this artificial ripple, the neurons that fire fast are the same neurons that fired fast before during slow wave sleep. So uh, is this a good thing? Well, so it's a good thing because it says that there is some rigidity. Once a trajectory starts, it's very difficult to perturb this, this trajectory or this attractor mechanism. 
And we can exploit that because it turns out that the duration of the sharp waves, just as the duration of the up states and down states, are log normally distributed. And then the, we learned it from, from uh, we, we learned from experiments that the the minority, the, the wide ones, are the ones that are useful because they are associated with a novel environment and they are associated with correct responses. That is, whenever memory is, is, is imposed on the hippocampus, there is a requirement for memory, then we have many more longer sharp phase. If we have many more longer sharp phase, then let's extend the duration of normal sharp phase into longer ones and see what happens. And this is a closed-loop uh, experiment where you, 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 you get a sharp wave and you prolong it, and there is a result of prolongation, what you will find that the animal's memory performance gets better. So how does it really work? That's uh, an interesting problem, but we solved this. The, we, we provided a mechanism in this, in this uh, paper, and uh, we were very happy about it. Now, I'd just like to summarize, because my chairman is uh, waving his hand that I'm, I'm running out of time, that, that the log domain rules are important. It, is, it allows us to think that there, is a, there are two brains in our heads. One is what I call the good enough brain that is there for us all the time. It acts fast. It uses only 10% of the resources, uh, the, both the hardware and the software, and it's it good, good enough to get by. If you would like to have precision, then you have to recruit many, many more neurons. Then the, the, the final slide here is the, probably the most dangerous one. Said, well, the inside out idea is very different from the outside in, suggesting that we are not imposing anything from the outside world. The brain generates enormous amount of patterns. They are like a dictionary full with nonsense words. In order to make sense or add sense to those words, that has to be matched the environmental inputs have to be matched to uh, pre-existing patterns. And the cartoon just shows that the hippocampus can, for example, can generate myriads of patterns, but only a fraction of them will be meaningful for the neocortex, the ones that have been associated with previous experience. So I know it was complicated, and uh, uh, this... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know how much Nikos would be able to uh, <laughs> recreate from what I told you, but never mind it and don't worry because uh, there is an extended version of this. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, questions? I will, call your, I will call your final conclusion as a platonic vision. I mean that you have a pre-knowledge about uh, what's going on down, uh, down, down there, but maybe it's also possible that the brain is generating explanations about what's coming on. I mean that, uh, that is creating its own models and try to explain all this electrical storm and give some, some sense to it. So did you listen what he was saying? He was trying to simplify. He said there is Socratic and Platonic, right? This is not quite Platonic. Part of it is Platonic, but what I told you, the primary thing is action. The Platonic people were chained. The only way how you can learn about the world is you go out and you leave your cave. And this is my primary saying, that you have to leave the cave. You have to act, you have to do things. And this is what the platonic uh, metaphor breaks down. But I understand what you are saying, and I agree that indeed a lot of things are preformed. So you can put the platon together with action, and then uh, it improves a little bit. Another question? And very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, <clears throat> how much um, the the organization, the micro circuit, can explain your result, and like uh, maybe it's a bit of chicken and egg, but somehow if those like neurons with like high, I mean fast and slow exist, maybe you could just explain it by their position, their their specific uh, role in the micro circuit, and maybe some are more uh, 
uh, connected and can inhibit the others or something like that? Yes, something like that. Okay. <laughs> exactly. The primary thing is you generate a network and the network generates is dynamic and this is the fundamental thing. We add things on, such as add an output and the output is moving the sensors and then the sensors come back to, the, to this hardware and say what happens. If you, if you are doing human organoids now, human brain organoids or, or tissue culture, they do a lot of things that are useless. They are just generating up and down, up and down state. You add a little bit of, of uh, subcortical neurotransmitters, they behave a little bit like uh, the waking brain. And uh, was it useful? It's totally useless. You can have 10,000 neurons from Albert Einstein brain and it's just nothing. But if you have 500 neurons and you connect it to the body and to the sensors and you have a loop that interacts with the world, that's a very intelligent nervous system. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. There is one more question. Oh, sorry, one more. A lady. There's a tour? Yeah. So, if it's true, as you said, that, that we have a pre existing patterns that we later map onto something, then it means that there are only a limited number of things that we can learn, which is equals to the number of patterns that we have. Exactly. But those limited patterns are limitless in your 100 years of life. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any other announcements? No? Okay, well then let's thank all the speakers for the session and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>